Welcome back. In this video, we'll talk about some of the hardest questions that came up on the April 2021 ACT test, also called Form D05. And you guys know what I always say on this channel about the ACT. It's unfair. They're always throwing in topics that never appeared on the test before. And the April 2021 exam was no exception. So if you took the test, then this video will help you review some of the questions you might have missed. And if you didn't take the test, then it's a great heads up for what you might see on your upcoming ACT. So if you find this helpful, be sure to hit that like button, share, and subscribe. And check out my playlist where I review the questions from other recent SAT and ACT exams. This will help you stay up to date on the most current material that appears on each test. This is especially important for the ACT, where they love to change what topics are considered fair game from test to test. Now let's get into the details of the April 2021 ACT. Now just a heads up before we start. For purposes of copyright law, we won't be looking at the actual April test questions. However, I have written cousin questions, or exact replicas, for the questions that appeared on the April exam. So for example, let's say that the real test had a question with a man in a rowboat going east at 30 miles an hour. I'll show you a question with a man in a canoe going west at 40 miles an hour. I'll cover the same exact topic, but with different specifics. And this serves two purposes. One, copyright law. Unfortunately, I can't show you the actual questions from the real test. And two, it's also designed to help you so that I don't give the question itself away. I'll walk you through the concept from the cousin question that I wrote, and then that sets you up very well to reattempt the actual question on your own. And by trying the real question independently, you'll be able to pattern it in your brain much more clearly than just watching me do it for you. But it's also so that I keep everything on this channel legal and on the level. Okay, here we go. Let's start with a few rapid fire tips and tricks to get warmed up. Question 20 looks something like this. For what values of x will this fraction be undefined? Whenever they ask what makes a fraction undefined, it means to find what makes the denominator 0. So you would take that denominator and set it equal to 0 and solve. Whatever values of x you get would make the fraction undefined. And question 24 asked what rational number is exactly between two fractions? If you want to find what's exactly between something, it's like the midpoint, which means finding the average. So you could just add the fractions and divide by 2. And question 32 looks something like this. What is the complex conjugate of the number 3 plus 7i? Anytime you see a complex number, it'll be a plus bi, a normal integer plus or minus an imaginary number. That always comes with a partner called a conjugate. And a plus bi always comes along with a minus bi. Same numbers, you just flip the sign in the middle. So in this case, the conjugate of 3 plus 7i would be 3 minus 7i. Those are called conjugate pairs. And for questions 2, 34, and 40, you could use a great shortcut that we've talked about in previous videos. Whenever you get stumped with all variables in the answer choices, you can always pick a number. For example, the expression big funky fraction is equivalent to which of the following? There are math ways to approach this with long division with polynomials or synthetic division, but you don't have to worry about any of that. When you see all variables, you could just pick a number out of the sky and plug it in. So let's just arbitrarily pick two, why not? If we said x is two, we can take two and plug it into the expression wherever we see an x. And I won't make you do that. If you were to plug that in, you would get four. Trust me, I won't make you go through the math. So if x is two, the expression gives us four. That means if we took 2 as x and plugged it into each answer choice, something else here would also have to give us 4. And without having to do each one, the answer is d. By plugging in 2 to choice d in place of x, that expression would also give you 4. So for questions 2, 34, and 40, whenever you get stumped with all variables, you can pick numbers. And check out my video here where we've talked about some other great math tricks you can use on the test. Now here's a question that was a little harder. And this topic also appeared on the December 2020 exam. On the April test, it was question 44. Looked like this. How can you express the area of the triangle above? So usually for area, we'd say base times height over two or one half base times height. But we don't have a height here. There's no line that goes from the top straight down. So when they do that, you need to use another formula for area of a triangle. You can also use area is one half AC sine B. What we mean by that, AC, two consecutive sides, 
times the sine of the angle between them. And that will work in any combination. So we could also say, for example, 1 half CB, another two consecutive sides, times the sine of A, the sine of the angle between them. Okay, now we're warmed up. Now let's slow down and get to some of the heavier lifting on some of the harder questions. You guys hear me say on the channel all the time how the ACT is unfair. They don't just throw in harder topics at the end, they throw in topics at the end that never appeared on the test before. Here are some that popped up on the April exam for the first time. Question 56 looked like this. A computer is programmed to randomly generate an integer from 1 through 7. A student programs the computer to do this 14,000 times and records which integer is generated. Which of the following best characterizes the distribution of the 14,000 numbers? Normal, bimodal, skewed left, skewed right, or uniform? This is a classic example of the ACT being the ACT. If you know what the words and the choices mean, it's not a hard question. However, these terms never came up on any previous TIR report before. And that's where the test is a jerk, throwing in something that never came up before. So let's define these terms. For a normal distribution, think of a distribution having one peak, like a bell curve or a standard deviation plot. Bimodal would have two peaks. Think of the word bimode, two modes, two numbers that would peak in the data. Skewed left means in the distribution, the bars would get taller from left to right, and skewed right goes the other way, bars getting taller from right to left, and uniform is data that is flat across, or for the most part, an even distribution. So which one would we have here? If the numbers one through seven are all gonna be randomly generated, then sooner or later, we can expect them to all come up roughly the same number of times. It won't be exact, some will be a little more, some will be a little less, but sooner or later, we could expect that those numbers would all appear ballpark about the same amount of times. That's gonna be a uniform distribution. The answer is K. And that's very ACT of them. It's not hard, it's just random. And the April test also included two logarithm questions. Now logs do come up fairly frequently on the ACT, and question 48 was the normal variation. But then they snuck in a new variation on another question. Let's start with the easier one. So the cousin of question 48, for positive real numbers Q and P, what's the log of Q over P? To understand this question, let's take a step back and talk about something called the product rule, the quotient rule, and the power rule. When dealing with logs, the product rule states that if you're multiplying two numbers, you can add those two together. So log of five times seven could be split up as log of five plus the log of seven. The quotient rule says if you're dividing, you could actually subtract the terms in the parentheses. So if we say log of 17 over six, that can be subtracted log 17 minus log of six. And then the power rule. If you raise something to a power, it gets bumped to multiplication. So if we say log of four to the five, that five, the exponent, gets bumped to the front it could become five times the log of four. So let's think about how that relates to this question. We're dividing the Q and the P. That means we're dealing with the quotient rule. We can subtract the terms. Log of Q over P would become log of Q minus log of P. So let's think about how that relates to this question. The log of Q over P would be the quotient rule. We can subtract. It becomes log Q minus log P. That's an exact replica of question 48. And again, these rules have come up on the test before but then question 45 kicked things up a notch with a new variation. It looked like this. The value of log seven to the nearest thousandth place is 0.845. What is the value of log seven times 10 to the 400? So let's start with a few of the things that we saw a moment ago. We're multiplying two terms within the parentheses. That means we could use the product rule. Multiplying means we could split it up as addition. So that would become log seven plus log 10 to the 400. And now we could use the power rule that we also saw. That 400, the exponent, can get bumped to the front to become a multiplication question. 400 times the log of 10. And now they tell us that log seven could really be written as 0.845, so we could just sub that in in place of the first part. 0.845 plus 400 log 10. So far, so good. We've used the product rule and the power rule. But now we're stuck with that log 10. What can we do with that? Whenever you see log 10, you can sub it out for one. Why? Well, let's just talk about the basics of logs for a moment. If you see log little a b equals c, that little a is the base, the c is the exponent, and the b is the answer. It could be written as a to the c equals b. 
So we have log 10 here. How does that help us? When they give you a log, but they don't specify the base, it means that the base is actually a 10. So in other words, by saying log 10, it means log base of 10, that they're not really telling us, there's the 10 equals x. And then rewriting that into an exponent question, it could become 10 to the power of x equals 10. So 10 to what power gives us 10? 1. It means x is 1. So if they ever give you a log without specifying what the base is, it means that the base is 10. Therefore, log 10 can be replaced with 1. So let's plug that in to where we left off in the question. In place of log 10, let's put in that 1, 0.845 plus 400 times 1, which becomes 400.845. That's the answer. That was a tough one. Again, previous ACTs have included the product rule, the quotient rule, and the power rule, but they never asked you to know that log 10 really meant 1. And here's another rare appearance on the ACT. This one's a cousin of number 59 on the April test. What are the foci of this ellipse? Now, the ACT often includes ellipse questions, so before we worry about finding the foci, let's just talk about what this equation means. When they give you the equation of an ellipse, the numbers in the parentheses represent the center, called h and k but you have to negate them. So when they appear here as four negative one, it actually means that the center was negative four comma one. That's the x and y coordinate of the center. And now each denominator represents the radii squared. That 36 represents the horizontal radius squared and the nine is the vertical radius squared. So that means that the horizontal radius would have actually been six and the vertical radius three. So given all of that information, the picture would look something like this. Center of negative four comma one, and notice that side to side, the horizontal radius is six and the up and down radius is three. Now they're asking about the foci. The foci are two very specific points within the ellipse. To find them, you start at the center and then you move along the major axis in each direction by a distance of C. When we say the major axis, think of it as the larger diameter, so to speak. So in this case, it means moving side to side. So from the center, we're gonna move C units to the right and C units to the left. And in order to find C, you can use the equation a squared minus b squared equals c squared. And where do we get the a squared and the b squared? From the denominators we saw a moment ago. That means the 36 and the nine could get subbed in. 36 minus nine equals c squared. And solving for C, we would get three radical three. So that value of C tells you how much we're moving in each direction along the major axis. So from the center of negative four one, we're moving 3 rad 3 to the left and 3 rad 3 to the right. So the coordinates of the foci would be, moving in each direction, negative 4 minus 3 rad 3 comma 1, and then negative 4 plus 3 rad 3 comma 1. That's another tough one. It was question 59. It's supposed to be hard. But I won't call it so much difficult as I will random. Only on one previous TIR report did they include a question asking about the foci. It popped up on April as well. But don't worry, not everything on the April test was completely random. It also included many common ACT topics that we've seen on the channel before. One of them was stoichiometry. In fact, this topic came up twice on the April test, and also on the recent December 2020 exam. Check out my video here where I walk you through the questions from that test. But here's a cousin of what appeared on the April exam. It takes three seconds for an object to travel 65 feet. To the nearest hundredth, what is the speed of the object in miles per hour? So the big theme of stoichiometry is that you want to multiply so that the units will cancel. So let's start with what they tell us, 65 feet per three seconds, that could be a fraction. Now, there are 60 seconds in a minute, so we're gonna multiply that by 60 seconds over one minute. And the reason we're doing it that way, with seconds over minutes and not the other way, is so that the seconds in the numerator will ultimately cancel with the seconds that we have in the denominator. And now let's do it again. There are 60 minutes in an hour, so we could multiply it by another fraction, 60 minutes over one hour. And for that, same speech. We want the minutes on top so that they'll cancel with the minutes we have on the bottom. And then from there, they tell us how many feet there are in a mile. But because we have feet in the numerator of that first fraction, we now want feet in the denominator of the last fraction. So one mile over 5280 feet. And before we do any math, look at what would happen when we multiply these fractions the feet in the numerator of the first fraction would cancel with the feet in the denominator of the last fraction. Likewise, seconds on top, seconds on bottom, minutes on top, minutes on bottom, you would be left with the units of miles per hour. And then from there, you could just multiply the fractions. 
you have a calculator, I'm not going to make you do it. You get 14.772, blah, 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 long decimal, who cares, rounding to the nearest hundredth, 14.77, and we're left with miles per hour. So with stoichiometry, always try to multiply fractions so that the units will cancel. If you put one on top, you then want to put it on the bottom. That way, they'll disappear. And let's look at one more tricky question, this time from the grammar section. This is a cousin of number 49 in section 1. That I completed a marathon in less than six hours is nothing short of miraculous. This might sound strange to your ear. It's actually fine the way it is. I'm going to give away that the answer is A. Why? This is an old-fashioned idiom or just a way that we don't really speak every day anymore. If you ever see that used like this, here's a great hint. If a sentence begins with the wording, that this happened, reword it in your mind as if it said, the fact that this happened. And let's do that here. The fact that I completed a marathon in less than six hours is nothing short of miraculous. And now you could hear it's fine. That's a great trick if they ever start a sentence with the word that. So this video should help you with many of the questions that appeared on the April 2021 ACT. Whether you took the test or not, it's a great heads up for what you might see on your upcoming test. And if there's another topic from this test that's still stumping you, leave a question in the comment section below. And be sure to check out my playlist where I cover other questions that have appeared on recent QAS and TIR reports. This will help you stay up to date with the most current material that appears on the SAT and the ACT, especially on the ACT where they like to throw in those new topics every test. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan. Thank you.